Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to our weekly town hall on um, our role in ending racism, uh, internal and um, systemic racism. And we've been engaging in this in these meetings for gosh, many months now. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. We've learned a lot. We've grown a lot. We've cried a lot. We've laughed a lot. We've done all the things that I hope are part of learning, a little bit of challenge, a little bit of uh, stretching out of our comfort zones, and um, as well, uh, a lot of comfort and support, which I greatly have appreciated. So I'm joined today, I'm Kathy Leach, on behalf of the Monastery Foundation, the International Monastery Council. I'll be your host today. I'm joined by several of my uh, colleagues from the IMC and the Montessori Foundation. First, uh, Jonathan Wolf is with us, senior consultant with the foundation and IMC board member. Additionally, we have with us Kitty Bravo. Kitty is also an IMC board member and the director of education for the Center for Guided Montessori Studies. We're happy to have you both with us today. Um, I imagine we'll have some others joining us. Uh, everybody's trying to log on. I know uh, lots of people are trying to deal with dismissal and all kinds of things at this time of day and doing their best to get on. And I do want to remind everyone that we do record um, every week and we post them. You can always find the link on monastery.org, but it's on the Monastery Foundation's YouTube page if you are looking for that. If you ever miss a meeting, you can always get caught up. If you ever miss a meeting and would like to um, add a comment or have something read, people email me directly. I'm happy to um, you know, enter it into the chat or speak it on your behalf. So you can always uh, have your voice be heard in one way or another. So um, most importantly today, I am welcome welcoming Sarah Lavallee, who's been with us um, and is the Director of Social Justice of the Child Week, works uh, directly with uh, Dr. Acker and our, our leader through all of this and through our social justice task force and our and our uh, weekly meetings of guided study and processing and interaction and discussion has been Dr. Cindy Acker. And so Cindy, thank you so much for being with us again today and mm -hmm. leading us on the next step in our journey. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so our moment of silence this week is going to be for anyone and everyone who is suffering with coronavirus right now, um, and for our national need for courage to step up, to speak out, um, and to be safe. And so with that, this is our moment of silence. Thank you. So I'm wondering, as I always do, right after the moment of silence, if anyone has had any thoughts this past week, um, if you were on last week, um, if you're new, just any thoughts that may have brought you here, but um, has anyone come across anything that's caused them to reflect this week at all that they'd like to share? And I'll remind you, if you'd like to raise your virtual hand, um, if you uh, click on the participants tab down at the bottom of your screen. It will give you a little virtual hand. You can click on that and uh, and I'll be able to see you. You can also put things in the chat. And if you raise your, your real hand, not your virtual hand, um, just go ahead and unmute. Uh, we were, we're small okay. enough group right now, but as it gets busier, we'll use the virtual hand. Kitty, go ahead. Well, not to get too political, but um, I've been thinking and would like to call upon all of us to put some energy into healing on um, feeling a need for some healing this week after some pretty intense energy we experienced on Tuesday because of the debate. 
and I was just talking to somebody today how things, a lot of people just seem agitated that there's almost, we've seen kind of an increase in people being agitated and angry over the least little thing. And I just think that situation put a lot of hostile energy in the world. And so let's all work together to heal that and, and uh, bring healing change. Mm -hmm. So that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, uh, I, I was mentioning, it just so happened there was an, there's a, if you, any of you have seen the New York Times today, there is a lead article on the front page, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's a very long piece of research, runs back several pages, called For Black Girls, School Discipline Doesn't Always Look Like Justice. And I'll just read you the first introductory paragraph. It's very interesting. Zuka, let me see if I can pronounce this correctly. Zule, Zule Kai McKinsey's uh, once silly sociable daughter has stopped seeing friends, talking to siblings, and trusting anyone. Changes Mrs. McKinstry dates to the day in January 2019 when her daughter's school principal decided that, quote, hyper and giddy were suspicious behaviors in a 12-year-old girl. Mrs. McKinstry's daughter was sent to the nurse's office and forced to undress so that she could be searched for contraband that did not exist. And the mother, the mother says in this article, it's not fair that now I have to say to my daughter, it's okay to be black and hyper and giddy, and that it's not a crime to smile, Mrs. McKinstry said, and my daughter doesn't believe me. It's a, a really interesting article uh, that supports, sort of goes beyond the, some of the constructs that have been discovered about how uh, black ma young males are sort of targeted for strange and, and unfair discipline, but it also talks about that sometimes the girls take equally heavy hits in a very different way that really uh, impacts their psyches. So, called uh, for Black Girls, School Discipline Doesn't Always Look Like Justice. Hmm. New York Times. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, Fred, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with what Kitty had said that um, as a res I wanted to ask as a result of last Friday's meeting, I was very uh, moved by the poem at the end uh, regarding uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, it gave me, put me into a different state, uh, more of someone who was going to return to participating rather than completely withdraw. But I didn't know who the poem was written by, and I also avoided watching the debate because all I do is get agitated from it, and uh, I felt much better having the poem in mind rather than having his acting out in mind. So if I could find out the name of how I could reach that poem, I'd like to share it with other people. Yes, I thought I sent it to Tim, but maybe I forgot to do that. So I will, I'll definitely send it out to get it posted on and, um, and send the name of the person who wrote it. I've got it, Cindy. I'll, I'll look it up and uh, repost it. I did, oh, terrific. I put it on Facebook last Friday. Oh, okay. And there was also the reference to the, I think it was a poem also about winter, which had just preceded it, which I'd also like to have. Sure, Sarah, you and have I, that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. We can mm, put those absolutely. in the post if we can find them during the meeting. That would be great. Um, sure. Are you asking me to repost the snowflake one? Yes. Yeah, okay. thank, thank you, Sarah. Louise Kelly is next. And then Mike, I see you've posted something. So if you want to tell us about that, we'll go to Louise first. Um, it's been an interesting week. I've had um, several friends, two of whom are people of color that have been uh, testing positive and one of whom had a very rough time with COVID. So my thoughts mm -hmm. are with them. And uh, shouldn't surprise anybody that their access to healthcare is not the same as everybody else's. Um, I also want to recommend this book. I think it just recently came out. It's called Loretta Little, Little Looks Back, Three Voices Go Tell It. It's by Andrea Davis Pinckney. Some of you may know that name. And it's illustrated by her husband, Brian Pinckney. It's really for um, older students. It, it's got some very child-friendly illustrations. 
in black and white, so it would work well on Zoom for a lesson, mm -hmm. but it's actually a chapter book and it's monologues from three siblings dealing with uh, uh, gigantic events in the 60s and their voices mm -hmm. are very distinct. It's like a play, but it's also written on a fairly high level, but you could definitely do it as a read aloud or have children act out uh, portions of it, including in a Zoom session. So it's a real find as far as I'm concerned. Louise, would you uh, mind putting the name and the author in the chat? People like to save the chats and have all the information in one place. So that would be really helpful. Thanks. You're welcome. Mike, you put a, a interesting article. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about that? So yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I, I read that article about um, a month ago or two months ago. Um, and just on the tail end of what Jonathan was saying, it popped into my head because it was along similar lines concerning young black boys. And it just kind of mentions how uh, in the public school uh, arena, teachers will sometimes, um, uh, they classify young black boys on a different scale. So for example, their, their, their behaviors uh, are looked at as more adult. Their, their infractions are looked at as lack of maturity when they're only five years old. You know, it's like, you know, he's aggressive. <laughs> uh, while uh, uh, in comparison, somebody else might be looked at as just, you know, ADHD or scatterbrain or something. Like, and, it, and it kind of draws a lot of parallels. I didn't intend to mention it. I just thought it was a very interesting read. And then it asks the individual teacher to kind of um, self-examine to see if they're um, kind of taking part in any of these activities innately or kind of subconsciously. That's all. I didn't mean to speak on it, but that's what it was. And I thought about it when John shared what he shared. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for putting it in context for everybody. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Uh, any other comments uh, or reflections? I'm looking for virtual hands, but I'm also looking for real hands too. So, oh, Karen Kelly, go ahead, Karen. You um, can unmute. Um, yeah, I was uh, appalled to hear, not surprised, but appalled to hear the news this morning about uh, two men who have been behind a telephone sort of a project um, in Michigan and other states where there's a big black population in urban areas, the send, sending out uh, phone calls, intimidating um, black voters regarding um, whether they would be, vac be forced by the CDC to be vaccinated. Um, there's all these threats that are in this phone call so that they should not vote by, vote by mail because somehow the people that have power will be able to get to them. Um, and again, this is not new, um, but it's, it's so aggravating and trying to figure out how do we create a country where we don't do that and we put people away that do do that. <laughs> so anyway, there are attorneys general that are in these states that are working to, to get these people doing these kinds of of things, actions. So yes, yeah. and it's in quite a few states, which is really challenging. I said to Kathy, I was having a very difficult time not talking um, race and politics today, um, but I said I was going to talk about something else, and so I was going to hold hold my my words and um, carry on with what we were going to discuss today. <laughs> it's difficult. So Kathy, shall I go? Yeah, it looks like everyone's uh, ready to move on. Thanks. Okay, so I mentioned that I was going to do two weeks of race as a social construct. Um, and I, I wanna do this with you. And so I would like, I'm gonna take you through some things, but I'd also like you to share um, things, their, their little tidbits that I heard in my head that I thought, oh, I learned a little bit about that in school, or oh, I heard a little bit about that. And so if there are things that come up, add into this story, because we're going to give you a complete story. And I, I will give you a disclaimer um, for um, anyone who is attached to a particular country. I may very well call that out in this discussion. Um, and where, human beings originate um, comes up to. And sometimes there are challenges around that. And so I just want you to know that we're gonna take the information 
Um, but what I'm giving you is, is the, the true history of um, the origin of race because it was constructed. It didn't happen from the beginning. Um, there were no races from the beginning. And so we're going to talk about how that occurred so that we can understand it better and so that we can figure out what do we do with that. Um, so Sarah, if you can call up my PowerPoint, and I'm going to just give you a, a quote while she's doing that by a woman named Angela Omwachi Willick. She's a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law. Um, and she wrote a book called According to Our Hearts. Um, she says, race is not biological. It is a social construct. There is no gene or cluster of genes common to all blacks or all whites. Were race real in the genetic sense, racial classifications for individuals would remain constant across boundaries. Yet, a person who could be categorized as black in the United States might be considered white in Brazil or colored in South Africa. So somewhere in history, race was created, which is why we call it a social construct. And my challenge is, can it be changed? Go ahead, Sarah. So I want to um, just share you that, show, show you this. I was actually gonna ask ahead of time and then I forgot um, who can tell me what's the difference between race, ethnicity and nationality. Does that make sense to you as you see this definition? Um, because sometimes we get confused with what that is. Um, but um, race and ethnicity actually um, were, I, it's not even interchanged. Race was ethnicity um, a long time ago. Race had to do with where someone lived, where groups of people were, um, where your community was those kinds of things that categorized you, that was what was considered, if anything, that would be the closest thing to what was considered race. Um, and Sarah, go ahead. Any other thoughts that anybody has had growing up? Did you have terms that came up or definitions that came up or how you saw, um, how you saw the definition of what race was or what ethnicity was or nationality? I can't tell if there are any I, yeah, thoughts I'm not, out there. I'm not seeing any uh, hands up or anything, so. I, I, I had a class in, in college, really quick. I had a class in college where they said that there was an uh, um, anthropology class and the professor mentioned that, and I don't know that this is true, but she said that basically we're all a part of the human race, uh, but we're different ethnicities. That's, that's how she defined ethnicity from race, that, you know, there is really, you know, she said the focus and the difference is in the ethnicity, not in the race. We're all the same race. I don't know if that's true. I've, I've never really well, it definitely isn't what's true now because, because we've recreated it. Um, but um, according to, initially, the, the, the term didn't even exist in that way, except, except to say that we were all um, a part of one group of people, which you could say would, would be a race. Um, and and people were categorized by what is the closest thing to ethnicity. So what she's saying is pretty, pretty close. It's just not what we're doing now. Um, Sarah, can you go to the first video? You may think you know exactly what race you are, but how would you prove it if someone disagreed with you? The fact is, even though race drives a lot of social and political outcomes, race isn't real. One of the first people to attempt to categorize humans according to race was a German scientist around 1776. He came up with five different groups according to physical appearance and geographic origin of their ancestors. Americans of European descent eagerly bought into this type of thinking around the same time. Some historians have said the idea that there were different races helped them resolve the contradiction between a natural right to freedom and the fact of slavery. 
if whites were their own distinct category, then they could feel a lot better about denying freedom to people who they labeled black and decided were fundamentally different. But as political priorities change, definitions of race in America adjust right along with them. For example, if you were of Mexican birth or ancestry in the United States in 1929, you were considered white. Then, the 1930 census changed that to non-white to limit immigration. Later, when the U.S. needed to increase its labor force during World War II, these people were switched back to white. And what it took to be black once varied so wildly throughout the country, from one quarter to one sixteenth to the infamous one drop of African ancestry, that people could actually change races just by crossing state lines. Then, suddenly, in 2000, the government decided that Americans could be more So she gives us that, uh, that little bit of information that, um, there we go. Um, you can go on to the next, next slide. She gives us that little bit of information that, um, that race could change and did change. Um, and that's not the only example when race changed and people were white and then were no longer white and then became white um, or the other way around. And so it has become this. We talked about what Michael just said that um, his professor said that it was much more um, one's ethnicity. Initially race was according to your your geographic location or the groups of people that you were with or in your family or in your community. But now, uh-oh, Michael is saying he can't hear. Can everyone else hear? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I can hear him. Um, yep. I'm not sure, Mike, check your volume on your computer. But now race is definitely connected to a person's physical qualities that makes them different from other people. And we have definitely, according to that, grouped people into different categories and, and racialized them. And so people end up looking at your skin color, your hair texture, your eye shape, your facial, facial features. And I would imagine that almost everybody could come up with some term or some uh, unfortunate sharing of information or joke or um, song that has come up that has racialized people and who they are um, and their, their eye shape or their hair texture or their skin color or their facial features, which has made this shift where this, we took this idea of race and then it became racism. Sarah, you can go on. And yet scientists say now that the distinction of people into different classifications of race is, is false. It's a false classification that is not based on any accurate biological or scientific truth. The distinction it says here that we make between races has nothing to do with scientific truth. It is a social construction or a political construction. It is something that was created by people for a particular political or social purpose. It was created as a classification of human beings with the purpose of giving power to people who were white to legitimize the dominance over people who were not. That is how the, how the distinction of race came up. So, as far back, and I did research as far as I could go back, um, the closest thing that I could come up with was in, in the 1200s that there was a distinction that was given to Jews um, to distinguish them from the, from the rest of the population of England. Um, and that, that, although not called race then, was the first seeming understanding of that kind of division of race like that that happened. Sarah, go ahead. Um, Navir, um, you have something in the chat. Do you want to speak now? Yeah, I, it just reminded me, someone I think on this call mentioned the book Cast last week. And yes. I started uh, getting into that book this week. 
and it seems to fit right in with what you're talking about now is reframing race and our the distinctions that we make as a caste as caste the american caste system and it just made a lot of sense to me to explain what's happened um and how it's not just an unfortunate thing like slavery wasn't an unfortunate thing that happened it really was the fabric that the whole society was constructed on um, from the beginning and um, but it was invented you know as a caste system to keep the dominant group dominant yes and it's difficult i was trying to figure out how i could discuss this without having such a connection to slavery but that was impossible because the entire reason why race was constructed constructed had to do with domination of society. Um, and so I, I couldn't say one without the other. And so it, um, it shows here that the, the first people that the English tried to enslave were actually Irish. And after that, then they attempted to enslave indigenous people. Um, and it's when they discovered that it wasn't working because um, they started to revolt um, and they couldn't get them to, to work properly. Many of the indigenous people were getting sick. And so the next best group of people were Africans. And, and that labor force, they were able to get in large number and they were able to take them over. And so they did. Sarah, go ahead. And so in the 18th century, when people started to get upset um, over the enslavement of Africans um, and many pro-slavery pro pro forces started to look for how could they justify the actions that they had, they went to scholars and to scientists to say, um, what, what is your view on this? Because people were starting to come up with things back in the um, 15, 1600s that had to do with differences of people. And so they started to turn to scientists and, and scholars to look for information that they could provide that showed that there in fact was a difference between, between people of color and people who were white. There was a difference between Europeans and the people that they were enslaving. And scientists stepped up and so did scholars. And I think maybe that is why now scientists are trying so hard to, to undo what has happened with race and to say, we need to come out and change this, um, this ideology. Um, because it is one that proclaimed that the social and intellectual inequality was unalterable. So if we could prove that there were these groups of people who were not as good as us, who would always be not as good as us, um, who intellectually would always be inferior, who socially would always be inferior, <clears throat> and whose brains were not as, um, as well-made and constructed and um, as the brain of someone who is a white European, then it gives you the justification to be able to treat them differently, to enslave them, to use them for labor as you would an animal. That they have enough um, going on that they could follow directions um, better than an animal and that they could work longer um, and that they would be able to be exactly what was needed to be able to provide, um, to provide the English um, and the Europeans at that time with what they needed to be able to um, continue to um, to have their land um, worked on and to have their society sustained. Sarah, go ahead. So let, let's look at, at a tidbit of that. And it's a longer than the other one, but hold out. And she, she speaks very quickly, but, um, but listen carefully to the story. 
Okay, so let's get started by asking, what were some of the earliest definitions of race? Well, before we started thinking of race along the lines of biology, genetics, or phenotype, aka physical appearance, did you know that it was largely considered a category of kinship or group affiliation? In the 16th century, we started to see the use of the word race in English, but it isn't attributed to physical traits or behavior. It meant, quite literally, that you were all members of the same household, group, or shared a common ancestor. But when did race shift to being less about kinship groups to sounding more complicated than the lyrics to I'm My Own Grandpa? Well, we can see that starting in the colonial era. And that brings us to our second question. Why did we see the shift in the idea of race in the 17th and 18th century? The answer to this question is firmly rooted in two things. The rise of global capitalism that was backed by slavery and colonialism, and a period of theory Organizations in Europe known as the Enlightenment. When the Spanish began the colonization of the Caribbean and later Latin America after 1492, they looked to native populations to mine silver and gold under brutal working conditions. They set about enslaving, attacking, and murdering those who didn't comply. Thousands of native people died as a result of overwork, genocide, or because they were exposed to new diseases brought over with the Spanish settlers. And when England established its first successful long-term colonies in North America in Virginia in 1607, they looked to mirror this pattern of enslavement with native people while also seeking copious amounts of silver and gold. But they had limited success with this route because one, Virginia wasn't exactly rich in gold, and two, native populations were able to resist the efforts of early settlers through fighting back or escaping and blending into adjacent native groups. English settlers still wanted to make money off of this venture, so they began to look to alternative ways of making Virginia profitable. And that came in the form of tobacco. But a major problem with growing tobacco is that it requires a ton of labor, and the laborers needed the agricultural skills to turn the crop into cash. Because they had already met with sustained resistance from native populations, English settlers looked to other potential labor sources, enslaved Africans and indentured British laborers. There are some important distinctions to make between these two groups. First, indenture was a contractual agreement with fixed terms that varied widely. Some indentured servants were brought to the colonies against their will, either as a punishment or because they were children. Terms of these contracts were often very exploitative, but many came willingly in exchange for their passage to the new colonies. And many of these indentured servants finished the terms of their contracts and began lives as property owners. Enslavement of Africans was an entirely different category of labor from indenture, because one, slavery was for life, not for a fixed term or a number of years. Two, slaves were not considered human. Three, it was not a contract because it takes two consenting humans to enter into a contract. And four, slave laws were enacted codifying hereditary slavery, meaning that if you were enslaved and had children, then those children would also remain in slavery. With the expansion of the system, there was understandably some resistance, even from Europeans. So in order to continue to justify slavery, we start to see the pseudoscience of race emerge that can connected physical features, behavior, and legal rights right around the 18th century when colonial use of slaves was expanding. Anthropologist Audrey Smedley notes that scientific ideas about physical appearance and racial difference in the 18th century were largely folk ideas used to justify already existent social norms. So as a result of a desire to perpetuate systems of exploitation, more and more distinctions were made about the supposed differences amongst races, primarily the difference differences of black people from their white counterparts. This evolution of race became more concretized after social structures of slavery were in place, and not before, and was solidified by the Enlightenment. Which brings us to our third question. How did the Enlightenment impact definitions of race? The Enlightenment was a period of primarily European thought and ideological development that saw the emergence of some key concepts that tie back into today's discussion. First, there was a push in scientific communities to 
categorize the natural world using reason and creating elaborate hierarchical systems that emphasize the similarities between different species and subgroups and the inherent differences amongst others. And race was fitted into this same mold. As European theorists looked to classify the world into scientific groupings, physical markers that were already established social norms through enslavement and genocide were ways that they sought to prove that this was the natural order and not a social construction. For example, Thomas Jefferson, who was a proponent of concepts like individual liberty and freedom for white men, or those he considered his peers, also made claims that black slaves required less sleep than their European counterparts to justify excruciatingly long and inhumane work hours. And Samuel Cartwright, who falsely claimed that drapedomania was a mental defect that caused enslaved black people to run away from slavery, as if wanting to escape a lifetime of enslavement was illogical? The Enlightenment formulation of history also played a crucial role in the development of social ideologies of race. Kant, Hegel, and other philosophers of their day claimed that certain racial groups stood outside of history or had no history, and this included all groups that they considered non-white or outside of European ideals of modernity. This meant that groups that were devoid of history and culture were inherently less valuable and therefore subordinate to other races, and they were cast as the natural sacrifices of progress. These assumptions were also codified into law in the 18th and 19th century. The first naturalization laws of the United States in 1790 limited naturalized citizenship to free white persons and excluded other groups. Children born of enslaved mothers were said to inherit the legal statuses of their mother, effectively keeping them in bondage perpetually. And Native Americans were often denied legal property rights, which helped to expedite the process of westward expansion across the North American continent. And anti miscegenation nation laws were drafted in order to assure that people from different racial backgrounds did not intermarry or have children in order to protect ideals of racial purity. But these racial categorizations didn't always neatly align with skin tone. In his book, Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race, historian Matthew Jacobson notes that in the US, white or Caucasian was not always considered a unified race composed of anyone of European descent. Whiteness was often considered exclusive to Anglo-Saxon descendants, while other European groups were broken into different ethnic categories such as Celt, Slavs, Iberics, and Hebrews, which were considered separate races from the 1840s to the early 20th century. But in the 1920s, when there was a stemming of immigration from Europe, these different races were subsumed into one category called whiteness to shore up a cultural majority against other racial groups and immigrants, and this persisted throughout the 20th century. So how does it all add up? Well, race started you, as a Sarah. marker of kinship, but then we see it shift. So that was a lot of information. And before I sum it up, tell me, um, Sarah, let's come out of the PowerPoint for a second just so I can see people. Tell me what you picked up from it. What'd you get? Anybody just um, un unmute. Just unmute. You don't have to raise your hand. I, ca I can't come away with, and, I, and I know, I've read this and, and I've seen the video before, but it's the malleableness of it that just drives me crazy. That it can be, that it can be manipulated to, to fit a desired outcome and, and uh, result to justify just abominable behavior. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? To how a lie can be perpetuated and strengthened. I mean, we're living through that right now, but the size of the lie is, expands as needed by the oppressor. Anyone else? I was thinking about sort of Montessori primary um, materials, the sensorial materials, and the classifications that we think about and encourage children to make in terms of length and weight and heft and color and all of those things, and how on the one hand it builds sort of uh, an ability to see and discern the world, but how we use that as humans to assign value um, rather than just to notice or see wholeness 
is sort of where it becomes really, really problematic. And at the very beginning, before I was just trying to pay attention to the quick stream of ideas, I've been thinking all day about the political nature of what we are doing now in this country with immigration and how we're taking the same racial constructs and using it as a wedge and a weaponizing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I was thinking that it just shows privilege. Like that's all you see and it's still happening, you know? Um, so that's pretty sad. Um, uh, I was thinking that um, the, the numbers, for example, uh, if you have um, 10 million people from another country who walk around um, and they, 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 feed, uh, they, they, they feed themselves through agriculture and they don't wear shirts or they walk around shirtless. If you have 10 million people living that way and then you have 1 million people who take a horse and carriage and dress fully, uh, then the hand that has the gun gets to make up the rules because it, it just blows my mind that they can, these things can be dictated by the hand that's on the gun. You know, um, what makes um, 10 million people walking around shirtless, uh, living uh, off the land, what, what makes them wrong? I mean, the, the vast, I'm just giving an example, the, the numbers are you know, vastly uh, 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 higher in those situations. But you know, I guess it's just the way uh, I developed. All of her examples that she gave in, in, her, in her video, it seemed to be the, the, the people that were able to dictate um, were able to you know, enforce it with simply just because they could, you know, push that narrative. Yes, yes, yes. And it's certainly not the story that I was told as a child. Um, I, I was told the, the story about the people who came over and made friends and the whole nine yards. And, and I, I wasn't told that all of this initiated from one, one person and other people buying into someone's idea of domination of other people. And, and that that was wrong. Um, and it's funny because it has given me such a different perspective as a Montessorian for children when they take things from somebody else, um, or when they say, this is mine, um, and they go running off or they hurt someone else. Oh, I, I have such a different worldview around how domination plays itself out in small child behavior that you know they don't even realize. Um, and how much we don't pay attention to that when we're looking at behavior in, in making children change makers, that we want them to see that. We, we want them to be able to appreciate other people and to not feel that they're better than other people and to not dominate over other people. But what, what this story of history is telling us is that, is that at first it was people who were Irish but then they rebelled. So then it's like, okay, so who else can we get? And then it became the indigenous people and they rebelled. And so it was like, okay, who else can we get? Um, and there were these, there was this massive group of people who were in Africa who also had incredible trades that um, they could um, bring to benefit in the Americas. And so why not them? And so they became the, they became the, the reason to, to bring them over and to enslave them and, and to, um, to allow the country to prosper, to initially the colonies and then for America to prosper. But then when people with a conscience started to say, wait a minute, we don't feel that this is right, then there needed to be a justification for the, what they were doing, and the justification became race. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if, if we can then separate them out and to say they should be doing that because they're not so good. I mean, it's, it's what people look for when, when uh, 
black person gets arrested and they go to jail and they're trying to figure out was the person really wrong because the police officer hit them in the process or something like that. And then they look at, but look at what they did. Look at who they are. Look at what their record was. And so, so this was, let, let's look at who they are. They don't have any history. They're not like us. They don't dress like us. They don't have the history that we do. They don't have the things that we do. Um, and they don't look the same way that we do. And so let's, let's find a scientific way that we can come up with something and feed this to the population to say these differences equate to inferiority. And if they are inferior, they're not really humans. I mean, the churches went through that with, do they really have souls? And I think it was the Catholic church who said, well, we, we think they do, so don't kill them. Um, and then other religions determined that, no, no, we don't think they have souls. And so then we can actually treat them differently. And so anything that can other people, other them so that they're less human, um, gives the gives the privilege to, to then inflict pain, to dominate, to enslave. Um, and so, and so it, it was to, to the advantage of the Europeans who came over, it was to the advantage that that race continued to be a construct. And what got discovered very quickly in America is that whoa, America is really prospering on the backs of these Africans. Let's keep this going. And so this concept of race continued to advantage many people who were white and it just con continued. And at some point, well, I think I'm getting into the other video, so I better <laughs> not keep going. We'll go to Sarah and, any, and then any, Jonathan. Uh, Sarah, you had a comment and then John. You know what, I, I actually, it was, it was a little while back and I just was, the, the idea that they couldn't get the Irish to cooperate with slavery, it also would have been incredibly easy for the Irish to, to integrate and to, you know, change your accent and change the way you're dressing and you become invisible again. Um, and it became very clear when, you, when, when they found they could um, enslave the African people that there was a color, there truly was a color distinction in skin that nobody could change. You couldn't change that. So if they could just justify it as something, there was such a visible key that they could hang their hat on um, and make it all work that, that it was easier to point out who the, who the other was um, than say your, your neighboring country that had a skin tone that was very similar to yours. I was just pointing that out. Thank you. John? Yeah, this, this uh, what we've been talking about, this idea of how we, you know, over history, we've justified this exploitation. Cindy, if you recall that movie that you and I watched, The Sapphires, about the Aborigine rock group who went to Vietnam and sang for the troops. If you recall, at the very beginning of that movie, it's a wonderful movie, Sapphires, true story. They actually cited the historical fact that until the 1960s, Aboriginal people in Australia were classified as flora or fauna. They were not considered human beings until the 60s. I mean, it's just, it's so over the top. And as I was thinking about that, it also occurred to me, isn't that really the same continuum as a teacher who starts to get a sense of, well, these black boys are all more aggressive than the white kids. It's the same continuum, you know, just done on a micro level. It's, it's getting a, an image in your head that this is the way it is. Therefore, I'm classifying this group of people. I'm no longer looking at the individual. Well, the English, the, um, the English may have stopped trying to enslave the Irish. No, they, they found other ways of no, dominating them uh, right up till the last century, as far as how they... Uh, use them uh, as a labor force uh, so that what you're saying uh, holds, holds up is that the, the individuals will find some way of exercising that power uh, that will give them that leverage uh, to satisfy whatever need they have, particularly as far as labor is concerned. Yeah. The maids, 
all the Irish maids, uh, had it been 300 years ago, they would have been just Irish slaves. So instead they became Irish maids. Louise, you had a, a comment? And um, also Gail, looks like she had a comment. Yeah, I see Gail. I, I, just, um, I just wanted to add that um, the English never quite gave up on trying to enslave the Irish, speaking on behalf of my ancestors and the reason they left Ireland. Um, and they were not allowed to intermarry with the English or hold property or vote. There were several other methods used. Um, but yes, they did become servants that were paid. So it was profoundly different. It was not parallel. The other question I had was for Lisa. Um, you mentioned Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. Does she have a, a book on that or is it online articles about uh, the melanin, the degree of melanin and the health challenges? Well, she has an extensive body of work. Um, she was a physician, a psychiatrist. Okay. And um, she wrote, um, I'm gonna look it up for right now. She lectured, she taught courses, she wrote a book, The ISIS Papers. Ah, okay. The ISIS Papers. The ISIS Papers. She had an institute, it's an incredible body of work. If you're gonna discuss this work, you should be including her work with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing that happens a lot is it gets so very academic, but it should really include the people who were most significantly impacted by this topic, their voice, otherwise it becomes another, you know, one of the issues is everyone always is trying to tell us our story. Yeah. And we have our story to tell. And she's done a lot of work because it, when you look from a global perspective, this is just not a United States history, which this film of course shows, but this same archetype because of the impact of colonialism around the world, this same problem. And so when you look at the videos and you look at the imagery and young people and this whole thing, what I was saying about internalized racism, everything is idolizing a Eurocentric view. You have kids in China fixing their eyes and you have everyone bleaching their hair blonde and you have all of these things trying to still, um, you know, it has become so entrenched in the mindset of what is considered idealized beauty. Mm -hmm. The standard because it's associated with the dominant culture and the, and the physical aspects of, of the culture that has established on it. So. I think it's really important we recognize that if we're talking about young people's minds and training and teaching in school and how we actively counter that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, I, I think that we have misunderstood or downplayed or just never realized uh, the strength that this carried um, mm -hmm. because because this dominant view has has just perpetuated everything in history. Um, every part of, of every aspect of living as a human yeah. being. Um, and, and if there could be a, a, a puppeteer who's up here, who's been managing it all, it's like, oh my gosh, what, what, a, what a story they have given um, that we have all fed into that has perpetuated the, uh, the, the views of people, as you mentioned, the enslavement of people, the uh, absolutely everything that has occurred. And there's been this trickling of things that have changed up where, um, where there have been people like, like the Darlings who have said, is it the Darlings who were the um, couple who, black man and a white woman in America who got married Oh yeah. No, that's oh yeah, love. that Virginia, Virginia case I made love. the movie about. Yes, mm -hmm. people who started to say, "Well, wait a minute, I'm going to push back on this um, in one way or another," but but it it is so strong um, that we've all bought into it, we've all drunk the Kool Aid, and we haven't even realized it. Mm -hmm. And to to get the fact that that a concept that didn't even exist that way has existed and shaped everything that happens. And that's why I say race became racism um, is just absolutely shocking. Um, it's even so in the, when you look at our language, you know, I have a dark cloud. It was, you know, the association of any, all, all the associations in mm -hmm. our language of anything to do with blackness is negative. Yeah, I, I have my own personal difficulty when people talk about seeing the light. 
and religiously when people talk about God is light and all, I, 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 it just hits this place for me. And I do understand that people don't mean it in a racial <clears throat> um, connotation, but it, the, the whole idea of light and dark has become um, that light is good and the dark is not. Um, all, all through history, I mean, we've, we've just, we've shaped everything that we are and everything that we do around that concept of race in a way that we just haven't realized. Yeah. Uh, Gail had her hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly that the word miscegenation really strikes a nerve for me every time I hear it, even though I've heard this whole story a lot. And I, um, I'm aware that both my parents' families threatened to disown them when they decided to get married because they said miscegenation is a sin. Mm. And the stupid thing about it is my mother was Southern European. She is dark. It's just an accident that I don't have dominant dark hair and dark skin genes, but I don't. But when I think about miscegenation i think about what you talked about the other day about the exotic and the fact that if a group of people are exotic such as my mom or such as different people if a certain number of people are exotic that means the people that are not exotic must feel very inadequate about their sexuality or about their attractiveness and i think that's one of the reasons why we may be especially reacting about, like Mike said, the young five-year-old black boy, he is looked at as if he's more mature than he is. These children are not a threat to everyone's family that they will marry everyone's children. Um, but that word miscegenation just really, really, um, strikes a nerve and I don't claim to have any understanding of the depth of trauma of other people, but I can say that I do understand a little bit about that word because when I was born, I didn't have very much hair at all. And, uh, but as soon as I had hair, I started trying to straighten it. Mm. So there we go. Thank you for gotcha. letting me share. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gail. Um, Sarah, do you want to run back to the PowerPoint? Um, so this is what we just talked about, and um, I'm going to have you look at another um, clip that um, that more race theories started to come up as the need for more slaves became apparent. By the mid 18th century, all of America's founding fathers had arrived on the scene, but in critiquing their lives, how much consideration, if any, should be given to the slave culture into which the founders were born? Slavery, even in the 18th century, was without a doubt the most important institution in America. It is the institution that shaped not only the Southern agrarian way, but also the trade in the North. It is really what makes possible the optimism of America. Slave labor is essential to what was being produced in the American colonies at the time. Without slave labor, the economy falls. It's almost like gasoline. If we lost gasoline as a fuel today, would our economy stop? Absolutely. George Washington was born and always lived in a society, in a culture, in a place where slavery was the norm. Slaves had combed his hair, slaves had dressed him, slaves had put on his, put on his coats in the morning and brought him his chocolate and his tea. That was the life he lived in. Oh, Sarah, I guess you can go out of that.
You want to bring us back? Um, and so if, if you notice, the, this was the point in which I knew that I couldn't separate slavery out um, because it was su such a foundation for everything that was going to allow America, America to prosper that people had to have it. I mean, from, from that Eurocentric view that they had to have it. And so it became almost a desperation um, to find a way to justify it. Because initially people all bought into it, but then the voices became louder. And when the voices became louder, there needed to be something to push back to allow slavery to continue. And that's when science came in. That's when views like eugenics, that when that you, you start to look at the genes that people have so that you can breed better human beings. And um, this was something that had started way back in Hitler's day, and that you have to pay attention to how you breed people and that you have to keep that one drop of black blood or Jewish blood or um, indigenous blood out so that you can end up with a strong racial population. All of those kinds of things that started to come up and re-emerge um, to justify the fact that we had to have this lowered view of people of color in order to just keep going Otherwise, we wouldn't make it as a nation. Sarah, why don't you go back to the PowerPoint? So then that thing came up. What about that one drop? What about that one drop um, rule? And although it came up at, um, to begin to legitimize certain practices in law, um, it was actually something that had been discussed a long time ago. But it was also interesting to note that, that before the one drop of African blood became the issue or indigenous blood um, became a problem for Eurocentric um, individuals, um, Native Americans did not have the same kind of view. Sarah, do you want to share? We were just chatting about that. You're muted. Oh, you're still muted. There okay. you go. Uh, it was it was really about what the what the what was politically done as um, as reparations were made to the indigenous people. Uh, our government. Our early governments made sure that uh, to disadvantage the indigenous people so that instead of one drop you were indigenous it was the re reverse and that every time there was an, a, a marriage with a, a, a Caucasian you would dilute the part of, of indigenous that you were to the point where you didn't get the support that the country had, had was legally bound to to give the indigenous people even though it was taken away eventually anyway um, you got more and more diluted. So the reverse was held so that they could, our country could hold on to its slaves, which was the one drop rule if you were black. But if you were less than 100%, less than you didn't get the services that you were promised um, as an indigenous person. So it's all about whatever advantages the ruling party, the ruling peoples. Yeah, and as a, as a group, indigenous people really looked at what what was the maternal makeup of the mother, and that is what that is what they went by as a as a people, um, but that wasn't followed when it came to law. Um, and if you can see this quote, which I this is the piece that not everybody may feel comfortable with, but um, it says in 1895, George Tillman said it is a scientific fact that there is not one full-blooded Caucasian on the floor of this convention. Every member has in him a certain mixture of colored blood. It would be a cruel injustice and the source of endless litigation, of scandal, 
horror, feud, and bloodshed to undertake to annul or forbid marriage for a remote, possibly obsolete trace of Negro blood. And this was when they initially were discussing um, marriage um, between African Americans and um, white Americans. Um, and that was everyone's fear. I mean, the statement that he made that everyone had a certain amount of the blood of colored people, as he said, um, was shocking and fear, fear inspiring to some extent to some people. And yet they knew that there was such a great extent of slave owners who were having relationships with, um, with slaves that they knew that there, there were definitely many, many people who, um, who defied that one drop rule. Um, Sarah, you can go on. Okay, and I just, uh, Cindy, I just have to call out the, 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 the words you use, relationships. That's a very polite way of saying it. I know, yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I just want everyone to know that you know that that's a euphemism for something that was brutal that was done correct, and correct. consent repeatedly. Thank you, that was rape, and I didn't name it that way. Thank it you. Was, it was rape, and those, those men then owned those children as slaves. So they, they, there was a deliberate propagation of their own um, ownership of property by propagating children with their female slaves. So it's a shock. It's Absolutely. A shock. Okay, I'm sorry, you wanted me to go um, on to the next slide? <laughs> I just had a... Do you have your other slide? Which slide did you want? The, oh, the, the, the PowerPoint I have, the other PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, let me go to that. Okay. And so this, um, Sarah's gonna show something that we presented a while ago um, for people because there are so many people who were so concerned about being connected to um, people of African descent, and yet there were many. Person who wrote The Three Musketeers, literary author, Malcolm Gladwell, Carol Channing, whose father was a light-skinned black man. Betty Boop, I bet you didn't think about that. Beethoven. But we never thought of Santa Claus. Yeah, really. Right. This one's a shocker mm -hmm. because of his behavior and denial yes. of, of that experience of his life. Thank you, Sarah. So. Well, what is, Fred. Yeah, uh, I'm getting uh, somewhat uh, confused here, which I guess is expected. But what what how do we dealing with terms like um black lives matter with the color of the person's skin and african american which is has shown the crossover uh, a number of different 
groups of people the same way that the degree of blackness can also uh, cross over. So is this more, <clears throat> is this something that is showing us the problems with race as a structure, but also how do we deal with terms like African American? Is, is that, that's currently equated with black people now. Is, is this causing or creating certain kind of dilemmas in how we are re responding to people? I don't know if I'm making myself, I don't know if I'm- no, I, think, I think I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, the, the issue of race as something that somebody constructed, um, I think is because, because we've been for many years at a point where the people who have been considered inferior are trying to, to find some level of equality and equity. And within that, they've, they've come across different terms of trying to, trying to define who they are um, because they were, given, they were given the term. They were given Negroid for the person who constructed those five types of human beings. Um, they, they were given nigger, they were given Negro, which came from that. And so I think there, were, there was a, a, lot of, a lot of challenges around just trying to figure out how, how do we identify, not only people from Africa who have come from, um, come to the United States or were enslaved and brought to the United States and their ancestors, um, but also people from other countries who are dark skinned, but don't refer to themselves as African American because they are not. Um, because they may be from another country, but they may identify as being black. Uh, or they're from South Africa and they don't identify as being black. They, maybe they identify as being colored or they identify as being black. It just kind of depends on, on, um, on where you are geographically. And so I think in, in our, in our travels and in, in, in our journey around this issue of racism, I think we need to allow people to be able to work through their identity and where they feel most comfortable and how they communicate and just really listen for that um, and to use that. But what, what we've been seeing today is more things that have come out of the, con the construct. You know, it's like, marriage is also a social construct um, that that wasn't something that was always there people created it and it became a construct and nowadays some people say this is my wife and this is my partner this is my life partner um, this is my spouse um, and it's also people trying to figure out what what do they feel in that in this process of self-identification. And so I think we just need to listen for it for a while, um, listen and gather from what we're listening and allow that person to, um, to identify in, in the manner that feels most closest to them. Anybody else have a thought before we keep going? Okay, Sarah, why don't you jump back? This, um, this happens to be a woman who is an actor and director um, who is biracial and came out. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, and sorry, I had to play with that title. I just thought it was cute <laughs> because it was a part of what, what allowed people to be able to start to differentiate, which I mentioned. Um, but what it also did was to cause this major religious conversion because of race. Um, there became many Africans who became Catholics um, because they wanted to have a soul and they wanted to be saved. And they ended up being um, initially pressured um, by well-meaning white people who felt that they didn't have a soul and so 
help them through their own religious conversion so that they would um, be saved. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, and I mentioned I had to sh show the person um, because I thought it was an interesting picture of him and I thought, gosh, he doesn't look so, so white. Um, if someone really looked at him. Um, but he was the person who really came up with the concept of dividing humankind. He wasn't the only one, um, but he was one of them um, who, uh, who in Germany came up with the idea of looking at, um, at the bones, bone structure of human beings and to divide them up. Go ahead, Sarah which just really fed into and gave rise to, oh, it's okay, we have a reason now to be able to have slaves. And it took um, fighting through many scientists, including the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, to come to a point where they're starting to speak out to say this was wrong. What he did was wrong when he came up with people as being Caucasoid and Negroid and Mongoloid, it was wrong. And it says there, the belief in races as natural aspects of human biology and the structures of inequality that emerge from such beliefs are among the most damaging elements in the human experience, both today and in the past. And I find it interesting, and Sarah, you can go on, that to the extent that scientists have come out with that statement, that education has not picked up on it. Do you want to go to that clip? Sure. And this clip is by um, Dr. Carlos, and and he has. Oh, whoops! No, it isn't. Sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. This is. Here we go. History. Uh, this one. Correct. This is. No, was I wrong? Uh, I think that this is. This is clip four. Uh, the history of race and. Okay. Racialization. Mm -hmm. Race, in my view, comes out of a combination, sort of a confluence of two important things. One is cognitive confusion, and the other is an almost sinister, cynical contrivance of that confusion. So the first part is more or less innocent. You know, we're all prone to cognitive confusion around lots of things. The brain is quite susceptible to seeing things that aren't there and then running with it. And that's part of what happens with race. Um, it takes advantage of our desire and proclivity to dichotomize, to bifurcate, to categorize things. Uh, we are very good at this and that, even when there isn't a this and that. Another way to think about it is, and this is particularly useful in thinking about race, is that we very quickly attach deeper meaning to surface distinctions. One of my favorite ways of illustrating that is this. So most people, almost to the person actually, when shown this and asked which two substances are most alike, will immediately say the two substances that are the same color. And that, it seems very defensible uh, in some ways. When told, however, you know, that actually it's the brown substance and one of the white substances uh, that are alike, then the correction gets made. And people say, oh, I bet I know why that is. And I say, well, why is that? I bet one of them is sugar, and the other is brown sugar, and the other is salt, which is actually the case. And we know that the only difference between brown sugar and white sugar is that molasses was removed from one uh, to make it look a little bit different and taste just a little bit different. But they are elementally alike, whereas white sugar and salt are different in almost every way, uh, molecularly, in terms of where they come from, in terms of how we use them, et cetera. This is what happens with race. Um, people at a certain time in our history, 1600s into the 1700s through the 1800s, started to be captivated by the idea that surface distinctions between people meant something deeper than just the surface. What happened that was very unfortunate is that that 
ascendancy of thinking in that way about all things, including human beings, got coupled up with a very desperate desire on the part of the pioneers uh, of what was to be America to justify uh, an inconsistency in the way they were going about their business. Because on the one hand, the folks who were the pioneers really wanted to believe in a principle of equality between all people. On the other hand, they were treating some people who certainly looked like people in very many ways in a very unequal way, in a savagely uh, unequal way. The idea of race that was growing up at that same time supplied a very wonderful strategy and rationale for continuing to treat people in an unequal way in a society that was to be based on inequality. Thank you, Sarah. I really loved that as um, a, a way of bringing the information around and together. And when he said that, um, that we become captivated by surface distinctions and that that has meant more than things that are deeper and that when you couple that with a desire to, and he said domination very nicely, um, but when you couple that um, with a desire to dominate people, then you end up treating people in, in a savage way, even though you might be a person who might feel that they are principled and interested in integrity and democracy and justice. Um, and that's what happened. That's what happened. Um, uh, Kathy, can you peek in the chat? Because I've seen a bunch of things start to go in there. There, yes, there's, it's been active. There's several different um, links, of course, that Sarah has added. Um, uh, just, just talking about a couple of things. Kathleen says, I read and wanted to share it. Uh, the only true white people are those who are albino. All the rest are people of color. Um, and Louise has put in the loving versus Virginia that you had talked about. Loving. I thought it was darling yes. and it was actually loving. <laughs> close, <laughs> really close. <laughs> Yes. I thought it was a sweet word. I just remembered it that. Was, it was a sweet word. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And any other comments? I'm watching for any hands to go up, but we're just down to the last few minutes, Cindy. So, Yeah, so I wanted to know just how, how this information thus far hit people. Did it question. hit you? Anything that you found interesting, Mike? I have a question for, for, for you. To, I'm just wondering what you might be thinking here. So, um, you know, over the years, um, America, European nations, uh, all sorts of countries have come to the aid of other countries when they saw, you know, social injustice in mass, right? So um, you've seen, um, you know, we dove into, the, dove into the Second World War and the First World War and when anti-Semitism, you know, cropped up, you know, the United States and other countries jumped in and uh, into... Uh, intervened and I remember in the 80s growing up seeing you know I'm not going to play Sun City uh, crop up in I know that's only musicians but you know there's people recognize social injustice you know um, even as a nation we recognize social injustice um, calling for China to um, improve its uh, human rights record so we seem to recognize it but what 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 would keep it in place here in the U.S. what, what or what would make it who, who is in the network that wants to keep it in place? I guess what I'm saying is when we, when we clearly can identify what it is, whether it's anti-Semitism or slavery in Africa or tribal um, uh, issues in Rwanda, we, we're all disgusted by it. But um, when it's race-based or ethnic-based, but, but yet the, it's in the fabric of this nation. And I know that, that you know, some w w have wanted to keep it going. Why? What, what would make that be the case? Hmm. I saw Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl just put money in the, <laughs> in the chat and power. Uh, and power. Thank you, Cheryl. And power and fear. And fear. There is a lot of fear. I mean, it, there, there's fear around allowing people of color to be in power. There's a lot of fear around that. Um, and to be able to maintain a certain amount of power and to be able to maintain a certain amount of affluence and money, um, 
you, you can't have the people that you're using um, in, in a position of power. I mean, it, it, is, it is also, and that's a whole other conversation, but it is also why, why we look at the situation that has to do with drugs and people of color and, um, and incarceration. It's because it's another mechanism to be able to keep people of color where, where they can be controlled. Um, because otherwise you, you, you lose all of that. I mean, this is something that has been going on for centuries. And, and there, there have been enough people um, who are influential and affluent and um, powerful to want it to continue enough that they can even, um, they can even uh, assist their offspring to keep it going. I mean, when you, when you look at just what is happening in the world with right, white supremacy, and when you hear some of the things that are going on with white supremacy, it's like, wow, that is still going on, but it's also someone stirring the pot and continuing to assist it to go on. And it's, it's, why, it's why I say, um, isn't it interesting that even though scientists and sociologists have come out with the fact that race has been constructed and that it should be dismantled, the one place where you would think it, that information would be um, moved for a mandate to change the structure of what we say would be education, but it hasn't been. What, what would be the negative outcome of more affluent blacks? What would be the negative outcome of more um, educated blacks? I'm not saying that they're on, I'm just saying what would be the outcome of more um, educated, or I say people of color holding positions of consequence? Is it not what people are complaining about that there's a lack thereof? Don't we want more of them to have that position? There's two we's. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say there's, I think that the, the, um, there is a, an aspect of that that um, would it just be incredibly beneficial to the country. And there's another group who say, yeah, but, but then, then somebody might really try and do reparations, which is something we have to do. We have to move forward. We have to in some way address what has gone on, the, 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 the pain and suffering that has gone on. And that is when Cindy talks about the fear, the fear that that's going to cost people today what their grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents did is is enough to say you know I, then I think that we're still different and then we shouldn't you know race you know whoever that scientist is who says it's it's not true is wrong um, because they don't want to they don't want to part with the money they don't want to part with the the um, the position the position of power um, and it's it's one we have to deal with because. That, that clip that she, that the quote was written last year. That was 2019. When <laughs> I saw that, I saw that. 2019, That's we're nuts. having this conversation yeah. um, in the science world and it's shocking, right along with climate change, except that climate change gets more airing, right? We, we talk about yeah. that more than we talk about this. Because yeah. reparations, I think, is a very expensive, people fear it as an expensive thing that will take money out of their pocket. And that it's- you know, and, and and I also, I also think that it's not just the money connected to reparations, although I think that that's a big piece of it, but it's also the, that's a deep realization that we made, we messed up to the extent that we need to fix it. And there are enough people who, who would like to say, oh, you know, it's really too bad that that happened that time, that way back when, but people in their big glass houses are okay with being in their big glass house with somebody else who's living in the one room apartment building. When you have to fix that and there's the possibility that you may be in a smaller house because somebody else ended up with a bigger house, you know, they, that's a really hard, hard time, you know, I, and, and this is not an exact uh, comparison by any means, but um, a few years ago in Alameda, teachers went, public school teachers went on strike and I looked at the budget and I thought, gosh, it, it would be so simple if the superintendent just took a lower salary. Um, but we don't think that way. You know, we don't think, you know, that we, we need to fix this and equality may not benefit some people 
um, in the physical sense, but it'll definitely benefit the heart. Um, and so will equity. And we have to be willing to buy into whatever that takes and buy into shared power and buy into um, shared expense and, and shared power and things like that. And that's a hard piece right. for many people. And please acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that an, yes. an, that's a wrongdoing. Yes. Yes. We've got to acknowledge the wrongdoing. And Cindy and Sarah, I can tell you it's a really good thing that we have this scheduled for two weeks, this topic, because we, we are out of time for today, and it, we could go on and on, and I, I really feel like that every week. Um, there's so much to learn and so much to share um, on these topics, so I am happy to invite everyone back next week for a continuation of this very same topic on social constructs, so. Thank you Thank so much you. for all that you Thank do you. for us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us Thank today. And we do hope to see you all back next week. Remember, if you'd like to save the chat, you can uh, do that on the uh, chat box. The little three buttons will give you a save chat option. And the uh, recording will be uploaded to the Monastery Foundation YouTube channel so that you can see that as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you next week. Bye.